Okay, uh, today we are lucky to have Paul Bard, who is a PhD candidate at uh, Mila, uh, supervised by um, Professor Noruza Zarai and Christopher Paul. He works in reinforcement learning, uh, specifically on multi-agent problems, uh, such as emergence of communication, BCI, coordination cooperation, and is keen to leverage data and planning when possible. Where the research goal is to leverage agent-based modeling and mechanism design to build simulation tools that can assist us with complex decision making. Uh, he has a BSc and MSc from EPFL um, with a specialization in fluid dynamics and computational fluid simulation, and a uh, minor in robotics and autonomous systems. He's also spent time at INRIA and at FAIR with uh, Dr. Professor Amy Zhang. Um, uh, we're super excited to have you. Um, I think the, the the topic area is is uh like in incredibly exciting so um yeah i'll switch over to you and uh looking forward to the talk yeah thank you so much for the nice presentation and, and for having me and i'm i'm super happy to present this work uh, with, uh, amy um so i don't think i have to motivate the importance of multi-agent uh learning to to this crowd and many of you know that um many real world problems are multi-agent for instance uh, autonomous driving and traffic signaling, distributed energy uh, management at smart grids, uh, auctions and marketplaces, and uh, emergency response and pandemic preparedness. The question I think is more about why would we want to go offline? As many of you know, uh, in most of these scenarios, interactions are uh, costly and dangerous, dangerous to collect. And for instance, we don't want to have autonomous cars learning through trial and error with uh, human uh, drivers. And at the same time, uh, simulations may be really challenging because there are uh, many facets of reality to model, some of which can be really complex, such as um, the behavior of other road users and, and how they will react to their environment. So there is a growing interest in leveraging existing uh, interaction data and the work from Eugene and colleagues uh, uh, Nocturne is a good example of that, where they leverage the way more open data set to create a benchmark for autonomous driving. And so maybe a, a quick refresher on, on offline reinforcement learning. So we have an initial uh, phase of data collection, and we store all of this data in a buffer, and, and then we want to learn a couple of Uh, in the real world afterwards. And all of this process is done such that the policy that we learn performs well uh, at deployments in the real world. And the question we ask is, what happens uh, when we go multi-agent? So if we have now multiple agents interacting with the environment and collecting the data, and that we train a team of agents that we're going to deploy. And so the hypothesis that, that we make is that it's something bad is going to happen at deployment, that it's not going to work at deployment, and this we call the coordination problem. And so maybe a bit of definition. So there are many no different notions for coordination. There is, for instance, zero-shot coordination, adopt team play that was presented here uh, not long ago, I believe. And in our case, we're going to focus on what we define as offline coordination. And we give a, a broad definition to it that is, agent train offline, together or not, uh, perform well together at deployment. And I say together or not because this definition encapsulates both independent learners, so when we have independent algorithm training uh, the agent's policy, and so the only thing that these agents share is the data they were trained on, but it also applies to the centralized training, decentralized execution framework, where we have a centralized algorithm that trains a policy for each agent. And in that, uh, in that particular case, agents must share information during training. And just... Hey, Paul, uh, you're, you're, you're breaking uh, up a bit. Maybe let's maybe you could try turning off your yeah. video and maybe that might help a little bit. There, there's a lot of audio lag that's happening. Okay. Hope it's it's better now. Let me play a bunch of things. So so yeah, maybe um a quick 
a quick side note uh, to show that the CTDA assumption is actually uh, quite uh, mild for offline learning. And first, let's think about um, online learning uh, setting. So in the on online learning setting, the learners uh, must interact during learning with the environment and with other agents. So there is a need for physical interaction during learning. And so for that, we need embodied learners. And so there is multiple ways of doing that. For instance, we could have a centralized training algorithm that uh, reads from each agent sensors and that is going to write into each of the agents controller. Or we could have a more distributed approach where we have a learning algorithm for each of the, the agent, but that the, these algorithms need to exchange uh, some information during learning, such as the current policies or, or value functions. And so we see that sharing information in the online learning is really uh, communication intensive. On the other hand, if we think at offline learning, we are only learning from uh, interactions that were collected uh, in the past. So there is no need for physical interaction during learning. And so we can have virtual learners and therefore sharing information is trivial because this uh, in the these learners could be like for instance hosted in the same on the same uh, hardware. Is, is the audio uh, a bit better now? I think so. It's still there's still some lag, but I think it's better now. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Maybe it's uh, there is a thunderstorm announced uh, in Montreal, so I don't know if maybe I'll I'll lose the internet or something, but we'll see. Uh, and so let's start, talk now about like the offline coordination problem. So let's think about uh, this in terms of a policy space. So we have here the policy of agent one in the X ice, X ice axis, sorry, and uh, agent two on the Y axis. And an initial condition is given by an initial policy for each of these agents. And we also have uh, two optimal team strategy uh, that correspond each to uh, an optimal policy for agent one and for agent two. And so if we think about online learning, how this will go is that by chance or local optimization, one agent is going to improve its policy and the other agent is then going to react to that improvement and adapt its policy and so on and so forth until we reach an optimal team strategy and corresponding optimal policies. But in the offline learning setting, there is no interaction during learning. And therefore, each agent has to directly jump toward the optimal policy, its optimal policy, such that at deployment, they reach this optimal team strategy. And they have to do this for either one of the, of the optimum. And so we see that here we have a first challenge that we call the strategy agreement challenge, that is, which optimum to pick for the agent. Even when that is done, we have a, a second challenge that we call strategy fine tuning challenge. That is, each agent must be able to derive its optimal policy while relying only on data that was collected with the initial policies. And so this can be really challenging. So this is a bit of a picture of the offline coordination problem that, that we're going to, to tackle here. And so the hypothesis that, that we can propose is that current offline multi-agent uh, methods that are model free are going to fail at this coordination problem, namely strategy agreement problems and strategy fine tuning problems. And we are also going to hypothesize that this comes from the absence of uh, interactions between the agents during learning. And so we propose that a model based approach might fix this. The baselines that we are going to, to consider are IQL. So this is a source-like approach and you derive the policy from advantage weighted regression. So it's weighted imitation learning where you give more weight uh, to imitating actions in the data set that result in good outcomes and good outcomes is defined in terms of the advantage function of that action. And importantly, we're going to keep this baseline single agent in the sense that we will have a single agent trained with IQL that is going to control all of the agents at the same time. So it's going to be learning on the joint action. And this is like a centralized 
execution algorithm. So it's fully centralized. And this gives us an upper bound on strategy agreement, because if you're controlling all of the agents, you bypass the need for agents agreeing on which strategy to follow. And I'll discuss a bit this more in detail uh, in, a, in a minute. Then we are going to consider a multi-agent extension of IQL, that is centralized training decentralized execution. And we are considering several independent learners um, methods that are the prevalent methods in offline multi-agent reinforcement learning, starting with uh, a really vanilla uh, imitation learning and then going to the classical policy optimization and policy regularization approach. Uh, with, for instance, behavioral cloning as a regularization so that the policy stays close to the data sets and therefore generalizes well at deployment. And then with variations on this idea with more sophisticated regularization techniques and optimization techniques. And it's really important to note that all of these bases are... Um, uh, do we want to take the questions now? I can take the questions now. Yeah, if you want to take the questions now, if Max, if you want to unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, good talk so far. It's great. The, the audio on my end, at least, has been um, a, a lot better since the video went off. Cool. Um, so it, it, it seems like you're building up to something related to like a coordinated equilibrium style approach of attack. And I was curious if any of these methods you considered as baselines um, used any sort of fixed coordination signal or something to like roughly handle that? Mm, no, so we're not giving additional signal from the one that can be extracted from the from the observation. And so this is a bit like the, the challenge that, that we're going to investigate in, in the sense that how can you extract, extract a coordination signal from the observation that allows you, for instance, to break symmetry and coordinate toward one strategy over another? Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, if you, if you want to assume that there is no opportunity before an episode to agree on a coordination signal, that's a very reasonable uh, attack, yeah. Thank you. And and so, um, so all these baselines are, are model free, and so we are also going to investigate a, a model-based approach um, that, that we derive that's called model-based offline multi-agent proximal policy optimization, so MoMA PPO. And it's a dyno-like approach in the sense that we use the model to generate training data. It's And so the idea is quite simple, is that we learn a centralized world model and we use it to, gener to generate synthetics rollout to train our PPO policies. So we go from the buffer interaction to a learn world model. And with this learn simulator, we train our policies and we then deploy these policies in the real environment. And so let me give a bit more details about the, the world model. So the world model is taking as its input the global state and the joint action from the data set and is outputting the next state, the reward, and a mask that predicts if the state is terminal or not. And actually, we have an ensemble of, of models. So we have multiple of this world model. And from that, we can estimate the next state as a next state sample from a member of the ensemble. Then the reward is defined as the mean across the ensemble. And the mask is a majority vote. But really importantly, we also estimate the variance across the reward prediction and the variance on the state across uh, the member of the ensemble. And this gives us of the epistemic uncertainty. Uh, maybe a quick refresh on the epistemic uncertainty. It's the uncertainty you get uh, uh, when you don't have enough training data. And it's quite different to the aleatoric uncertainty that comes from noise in your measurement uh, with respect to, to the ground truth you're trying to, to model. And so uh, when you have this kind of, of absence of data, um, different members of the ensemble are going to model this in different ways. And so they are going to agree in regions when you have no, uh, you have little epistemic uncertainty, but when you lack training data, pretty much everything goes. And so uh, the difference 
between your different predictions is going to be a good estimate of, of this epistemic uncertainty. And this is really important because, as you may know, when we do model-based uh, reinforcement learning, a key part is to prevent the reinforcement learning algorithm to exploit the model's error. And why do I mean by that? If we look at the reward as a function of the states, and the ground truth is that it looks something like that, maybe in your data set, we only have this kind of, of data points. And this can, this can come from the data collection, for instance, this region here corresponds to the car crashing and we don't have example of that. Uh, yes, Eugene? I'm gonna skip ahead slightly just with a, a clarifying question. Um, I think the the experimental domain here is going to be MA Mujoko tasks, right? Yeah. Um, which as far as I understand are fully, almost fully stochastic environment, uh, fully deterministic environments. Yes. Um, so, I mean, continue ahead, but I, I'm kind of curious why um, there's reward uncertainty in these environments. But so it, it could be because we haven't data in some regions of uh, the state action space. And so mm -hmm. this, this is like epistemic uncertainty. For instance, if you have never example, you have no example in your data set of uh, the end running uh, sideways, you don't know the reward that is associated to that, even if that reward function is deterministic. Right. Does, does this make sense? Right. Yeah, but I guess all you can know in those domains is that like the reward is bounded and, and make some kind of smoothness assumptions or? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah, and so, yeah, but and so you can also have uncertainty due to partial observability, right? And this is something that, that we're going to, con to consider as well. Makes sense. So if we're back to this example, we only have that, the, the data points in, in that are shown in black. And so our, our model ensemble might learn uh, reward models that look like this, where they agree uh, when there is um, data points, but when there is no data point, um, they, it's just a, a guess. And so if we use this reward model to train our algorithm, the algorithm will likely, the reinforcement learning algorithm will likely try to go toward these states where it's expected under the reward model to get a uh, high reward. But in reality, this is a really bad solution. And why is that? Is that uh, we allowed our reinforcement learning algorithm to use rewards that uh, were predicted by our model when we could not trust our model. And so a way to prevent that is to use this uh, epistemic uncertainty and penalize the reward for it such that now the reinforcement learning agent has to maximize the reward, but at the same time, stay in regions where we can trust uh, our role model is going, is outputting the, the correct reward signal. Um, another thing we want to do is to avoid unfeasible data. And so this is just another way to say that we want to stay close to the data set and we want to do this in terms of value. And so for instance, we do this uh, with bonding box clipping. So, Imagine this is our data sets or data points, and the world model is, is has sampled these this new data points. We see that these data points are quite far from our data sets in the sense that they're not even comprised in the maximum component of all of the, our, our data points. And so what we do is that we're going to project uh, the sample data points into inside that, that bonding box. We also want to stay close to the data set in terms of rollout. And for this, uh, we start generating rollouts from an initial state present in the data set, and we only generate rollouts for a few steps. Additionally, if when generating a rollout, the uncertainty of the model crosses a given threshold, we stop the rollout at, we terminate the rollout such that we are not generating and using rollouts that might be unfeasible. So in a nutshell, uh, we're learning a centralized world model that is based on an ensemble so that we can compute epistemic uncertainty due to the lack of, of data. And then we use this uh, world model to generate rollouts by sampling a state in the data set, querying the currently trained for the actions they're going to take, generate the transition with the world model, clipping the value to the data set, 
and penalizing for uncertainty while terminating rollouts if it's too long or uh, the uncertainty is too high. And so, yeah, please. Uh, um, yeah, just another quick question. Uh, and so for these short rollouts, are you just bootstrapping at the end of them? Sorry? At the end of these short rollouts, are you just bootstrapping the value function at the end of them? Uh, yeah, exactly. Like in the PPO uh, optimization? Yeah. For a general, yeah, yeah, yeah. We just, so exactly. But so here it's really important. This is a, a nice, it allows me to, to make a, a nice side note. So it's important that when we terminate a rollout, we use like a timeout termination and not an absorbing state termination. So this is why we do the bootstrapping with the value function that that you just said. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. And so when you when you go like out of bounds for these reasons, are the, is that a termination or is that a is that a like a it's uh, a timeout as well. state or a timeout? Okay, it's time. No, it's a timeout. So this is why. So we don't penalize the agent for uh, having terminated um, a rollout. Why? Right, it's just uh, we don't use that data, and this is why I did like this. Uh, maybe it was not clear enough, but this is why I, I did this separation between uh, uncertainty penalization in the reward to avoid being exploited, and so to penalize the agent with avoid using uh, unfeasible data, just as training data, and this is like the clipping and the early termination of the rollouts. Yeah, thank you for for this question. Thank you. And so just a, a quick recap. So we have this different baseline. So we have a fully centralized one. We have a centralized running decentralized execution one. And we have uh, a few prevalent uh, offline multi-agent reinforcement learning methods that are uh, independent learners one. And we have our model-based uh, proposed method that we're going to use to tackle this offline coordination problem. And so uh, we are first going to consider a coordination game where agents are rewarded uh, when they pick the same direction, but penalized where, where they do not. And we're going to use three different data sets, a favorable one where agents uh, are mostly coordinated and so they go right most of the time, a neutral one uh, where they act at random, and an unfavorable one when agent one goes mostly right while agent two goes mostly left, and so they are mostly uncoordinated. But it's really important that uh, all the possible transitions are present in all of the data sets. And so a centralized critic can learn the ground truth um, value function. But as we are going to see, even with this centralized ground truth value function, agents uh, might fail to figure out if they should go left or right. And so to see this, we can look at what this implies for the joint uh, policy, so the policy uh, on the joint action. And this encourages the, uh, the joint policy to either be left, left, or right, right. And so if you, had no, if you had, don't have a prior on that, it's just like 50% of the time. But something that is sure is that you'll never use opposite directions. So this is why a centralized actor is going to be always coordinated. But now if we think about decentralized actor, we have to decompose this into independent agent actions. And now it becomes unclear for a given agent if he should rather go left or right without knowing what the other agent is doing. And so this means that there is a need to break symmetry for decentralized actors. Otherwise, it's just coordination uh, by chance. We're also going to investigate this in a more complex environment that is two agents richer. And so we have a first agent that control the first joint, agent two that control the second one, and then the goal is to place the tip of the robot on the target. And now the data set is given by a mix of expert demonstrations when where some experts, half of the demonstrations come from clockwise experts. So this means that experts are using a clockwise band um, configuration, and half of the demonstration comes from con counterclockwise um, configurations. And we also introduce partial observability. So the full observability uh, setting is like every agent observes the whole robot, the tip and the target, whereas we have two partial observable settings where an independent one where each agent sees the target and only the joint it controls and a leader-only leader setting 
when only the ridge agent observes the target position while both agents observe the robot configuration. But it's really important to know that in the partial observability setting, uh, the tip position is not given to any agent. And so it derives this tip position from the joint angle. And we are also going to consider um, the four agent ends. So um, each limb is controlled by a different agent. And the data set for, in that case comes from D4RL benchmark. And now the partial observability is either fully observable or uh, each agent observes its own limb, so the limit controls, and only one agent observes the torso information. And so the torso information is really important because it's this information that is giving you the velocity of the whole robot and its heading. So it's this is the information that te is telling you in which direction the robot is, is moving. And so I want to look you through the results and we'll directly go to the uh, the summary, if you'll allow me. And so what we, we get from the results is that for the model-free method, they fail at strategy agreement. And in, while they fail in that specific setting, centralized critic uh, perform uh, a bit better than independent, uh, so decentralized critic. Um, but uh, in the strategy fine-tuning fail, uh, fine-tuning setting, sorry, they fail as well, but it, it, now it's the independent learners that perform a bit better. And surprisingly, centralized actors, so a fully centralized uh, algorithm, also fails at strategy fine tuning. Well, and yeah, um, an interesting point to note is that among these independent learners baseline, uh, simple imitation is quite competitive. Finally, for our model based method, uh, it succeeds at, at both uh, strategy agreement and strategy fine tuning. And this means that a model based approach is, in that case, better than a fully centralized approach. So, this is really, really interesting. Um, we can have a look a bit at the, some uh, rollouts of the failure cases. Yes, please, Eugene. Uh, sorry if I keep interrupting. Let me know if you want no, me to no, not it's interrupt. Perfect. Um, if, can we go back to the private slide for a second? Yeah. Um, so I have, I have a couple of questions just, just kind of to, to set the stage and understand things a little better. Um, the BC agent, is this a partially observed BC agent? Yeah. Okay. And it's a, a BC agent, an independent BC agent for each agent that only gets the observation of that agent and the action. It's not a centralized one. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess that's not the most surprising because for like a lot of, for like the ant, for example, like the strategy is basically just keep, you know, wiggling your leg forward mm -hmm. basically it's just a very stable environment um but i'm curious about the the what what intuition you have for why the strategy fine-tuning has this like flip of independent learners working better than ctde and yeah. centralized actors failing because yeah i'm puzzled yeah, yeah that's that's a, that's, a, that's a good point so um how can i put that so uh, i think strategy agreement is really related to breaking the symmetry right and so in that case, it's still important that you get a centralized value that is, for instance, differentiating between going into the same direction in, or in opposite direction. And then the symmetry breaking can occur, for instance, uh, from numerical approximation in, on the value that we learn for left-left versus right-right that could be a bit different uh, due to approximations. While the strategy fine-tuning is more related to, to robustness, to change. And in that case, uh, decentralized uh, critics are going to less overfit to, to the data they were trained on, and therefore it's likely to learn more robust um, policies. That, that, that's my intuition about this, but it's, yeah, like more uh, investigation and experiments to, to validate or, or invalidate this is, is, is required. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, so if you, you remember, we had like these this two kinds of demonstration. And if we look at the failure case that happens for uh, model free methods, we see that the agent picked a different strategy. One agent uh, was thinking that the team was going for the clockwise configuration, while the other one was thinking that they were going for the counterclockwise counter configuration. And therefore they're missing the target. And as you remember, they don't have the the tip 
uh, information so they, they cannot course correct. But uh, if the agents were trained to, were able to interact in the, through the synthetic model, then they learn to, to agree on a policy. And what's it's really interesting is that they are even able to, to alternate between clockwise and counterclockwise configuration, depending on the target position. And so this means that they can even improve on the expert data set. And what I mean is for a given uh, target position, you can have two different uh, configuration with different uh, travel distance for each agent. And so the optimal one is the one with the smaller uh, travel distance. And this means that an expert that can only use clockwise um, clockwise configuration will sometimes be suboptimal. Um, if we now look at the, the results for the partial observable, uh, oh, sorry about that, for the partial observable end, uh, we see that in order to succeed, to, to run in the, in the forward direction, uh, the team lear must learn to be steered by the white agent that is the only one seeing the, the, the direction of movement of, of the robot. And if agents uh, were not allowed to fine tune this, this strategy together, uh, we see that uh, it's just start to, to run in circles, which is quite unfortunate. Ooh, this is not what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry about that. And so, uh, in summary, um, we hypothesis, and we can take a bit this this uh, take a message. So, offline multi-agent reinforcement learning uh, seems really interesting for uh, real-world problems, but we must be careful when just extending a current model free offline methods to the multi-agent problem because we are not accounting for this coordination problem and model-based approach could be a solution to that. Other some uh, insights that, that we can derive from the, res the results is that strategy fine-tuning becomes more challenging when you need to adapt from the behavior that is demonstrated in a data set, meaning that you don't really have strategy fine-tuning if just imitating uh, the, the demonstrated policies enough. And so this occurs when you have suboptimal data sets or where partial observability um, impose that you learn a different optimal policy than the one displayed in the data set. As this is, for in instance, the case with this steering behavior uh, for the partial observable hand. Also, partial observability is going to induce more state ambiguity in the sense that uh, different states are going to be to yield the same observation, and so this is ma this makes it more difficult to break symmetry or course correct. Finally, um, the the performance of this model-based approach is more related to the dataset's coverage than the lower level of expertness, in the sense that for partial observable, the performance with the random dataset is much higher than the performance with the expert dataset. And so an interesting uh, avenue could be to try to mix all the data set that we have and train this model-based approach and compare it to what happens for model-free methods. For instance, I don't know if a model-free method trained on an expert data set could benefit from training on the expert plus random data sets. Uh, but I think that this would be beneficial to this model-based approach. And there is an interesting discussion on, on, on this model-based approach is that actually the, the task that the agents are solving is quite different from the task that the agents were learning, um, the, sorry, the agents that collected the data uh, were trying to solve if they were learning. And this comes from the difference between using real-world interaction versus generated synthetic ones. For instance, uh, the initial state distribution is different because for the model-based agent, any state in the data set is an initial state. Uh, also, the reward is an intermediate average reward, and the exploration is, is constrained in the sense that it can only be a few steps away from the data set. And so some of, of these differences could be beneficial to the model-based uh, approach, 
For instance, if we think at environments where exploration is the challenge, and for instance, in Montezuma Revenge, where you always start with the same initial state and you have to do a long and complicated sequence of action until you get a reward, there is work that has shown that only using a single demonstration and using the states in that demonstration as a way of building a curriculum of our initial state distribution allows to, to perform really well. So this um, is- we have a, Sorry to interrupt, we have a question from, from Dave. Oh, yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, it, thanks Eugene. It's, it's not like super major, it's just on the last slide. I thought it was interesting you said that like a data set from generated by like random actors <laughs> performs better than like potentially some expert actors is that mm -hmm. because uh with a data set of just like random trajectories i guess you'd build a better world model or like a more diverse world model uh than if you just yeah. had like, trajectories from experts yeah exactly exactly it's like and and so this is true for instance for and when we you you don't need that much um you don't need that much exploration right and so uh, a random ant is going to get you the the feel like is going to enable you to learn the physics of this uh, moving ant so that then you can use it. Whereas, for instance, with the expert data set in in ant, the there is no much variability on the dis demonstrated uh, behavior, right? So you might never have these kind of examples where a one leg was able to steer and like to change the heading of of the of the whole robot. And this is something that you need. In the pressure observable setting, so yeah, it's exactly a, exactly that, like a, a question of diversity in the data set. Cool, thanks. Thank you for your question. Sorry, sorry, I missed it on the on the raised and the feature. And so yeah, this this kind of like uh, curriculum over initial uh, state is something that is inherently, to some extent, inherent, inherent, inherently present in in this model based approach, but. But some difference are, are, can be a problem. For instance, if you think about uh, our, our data set in gray and the rollouts we're able to generate from it, there is only uh, so far we can go away from our, our data set. And so if our optimal solution is outside of this region we can reach from the, from the data set, then it's unlikely we're going to, to, to learn it. So, so this might be a problem and it's a major limitation, I think. Uh, in there is also an interesting discussion in the sense that why did we pick uh, an online reinforcement learning algorithm to optimize uh, the policies instead of offline one? And this comes from actually a difference in the learning paradigm that we are using. If we think if you compare the two the two pipelines and we focus on the policy learning one, we see that offline RL model free offline RL algorithms are designed to learn to learn on a static data set. But in our case, the policies are trained on non-stationary data that is interactively collected through our uh, learn simulator. And this is much closer to what online reinforcement learning algorithms are designed for. Also, uh, offline RL methods are going to impose conservative policy updates to ensure we stay close to the data set. But in our case, we don't really need those because we are already being conservative with the reward we use and uh, how we generate the data. Another question is, okay, but why did we use PPO or on policy method instead of off policy one? And so, uh, because off policy methods are usually the ones that are used when we do model-based uh, reinforcement learning. And so the answer here is that the model-based uh, serves a different purpose in our approach. If you think at online Dyna uh, method, usually um, the policies are trained both on, on real samples and generated samples. And the goal is really to improve the sample efficiency, so to interact as little as possible with the real environment. But in our, in our case, uh, and so this calls, sorry, for off policy methods because most of the time these are more sample efficient. But in our case, we never collect additional uh, real environment uh, transitions. So sample efficiency is not really uh, a concern and model-based is more used to be able to adapt from that data set and coordinate multiple agents. So instead of sample efficiency, we are more looking for something like robustness. Uh, 
And so, uh, uh, a few limitations uh, with this model-based approach. First, it's, it takes longer to train than the baselines, and this is because we need to generate this synthetic data instead of just relying on this fixed data set. And also, this model-based approach is not a silver bullet in the sense that it's conditioned on the model world models uh, that we learn, so it's accuracy and generalization ability. And so, like we just discussed, it's 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 really related to this data, data set coverage. And it's likely that some tasks are, are going to be really challenging for learning a world model. We can think, for instance, as uh, highly stochastic multimodal environments where uh, a random um, uh, a random event is going to yield really different scenarios. For instance, the card that you draw from a deck is going to influence the, the rest of the game. And so this might be something difficult to, to capture from a world model that you learn. Or also complex dynamics, for instance, how your world model can be able to, to model other world users and how they interact to your action and, and so forth. So in terms of future direction, I think there is much to be done into understanding more in depth the, the model three failure cases and for instance what we were discussing with Eugene about uh, why in sometimes centralized training is better than the centralized one and maybe there is uh, uh, model free solutions that that can be found to these coordination problems i also from a practical point of view i think questioning a bit how much the complexity of some model free methods is 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 mandated uh, in in relationship with this coordination problem uh, might be interesting because in a sense sometimes uh, imitation learning goes, just imitating the data set does does a good job at it um and finally i think um to make this kind of approach practical it's in, important to to reduce this training time and so a way of doing that is to use the synthetic interactions only uh, for coordinating while still learning most of the task on the data set. And so this comes from mixing different uh, methods together. But there are like many open questions. And of course, uh, I think it's important to, to try to apply this to more complex task and environment and, and see the additional challenges that are going to be raised uh, from that. So yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. I hope you have, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for the great talk. So it, we have plenty of time for questions. So um, I guess if you have a question, yeah, raise your hand and maybe we'll even have some time for discussion afterwards. And thanks again for the, the excellent talk. So Daphne, you wanna kick it off? You're muted, by the way. I'm sorry, that was a mistake. I don't have a question. Oh. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, I'm, I'm fairly, okay. Yeah. I'll ask well, if, if you have one, you can go first, but no, if, no, no, you go, you go. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for the, the excellent talk. That was really interesting. Um, I'm kind of, so I noticed a lot of the experiments, I think all of them are basically like you take a Majoku, uh, figure and um, like the multi-agent setting is that they all control different aspects of the robot. But um, how would this really translate to say settings with um, say like two teams, like adversarial team or like, like a two team zero sum game where um, say an agent on a team learns a world model and tries to act, but then whatever they do uh, kind of impacts whatever the agents on the other team would do. Is that just like a completely different setting or can you imagine some way that this could adapt to that? Yeah, so so I, I, I really thought, uh, we really thought about like this, this problem in, in, in cooperative uh, tasks, right? But if you have two teams competing inside each team, there is still this, this cooperative aspect, right? And it's just the objective that your team is, 
is tracking is changing depending on the other team. So you have like com this kind two kinds of different levels of in 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 non stationarity. But um, I'm actually not uh, familiar with like uh, work on from offline reinforcement learning on adversarial tasks. Uh, so this is something I'm not really familiar with. And I think there is there are many ways of thinking about that. So having like different data sets for different opponents or a data set of different opponents. And and then the question is whether you assume that your opponent is going to be learning your modeling for your opponent on the data sets so you know what will you're going to be up against and optimize yourself. So this this bring, uh, brings a, new, a whole new level of uh, non-stationarity non due to learning that is is the other is the opponent learning or not and is he are we in a more game theoretic uh, uh, dimension or is, is the opponent still stationary and then I can maybe uh, put it inside the environment that I'm trying to learn because it's not going to change at deployment phase. So this is a really, really interesting question and really open one, I think, to, to answer. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Thanks for the answer. Um, so you think it's mostly in the, in the world model learning, uh, scenario where like you learn a work, you learn about your opponent's policies within the world model. And then you kind of like, train using that yeah so this this is i think this is an option if you know that the policy of the opponent is not going to change with respect to your behavior if you think that it's going to change there are many ways of trying to model that change and maybe you can model this change but i would do if i were the opponent with the same data that i'm using and so here you can create a world model only on the physics and then you tr can try to learn a policy with that learned model for the opponent and then use that yourself to optimize yourself and then you get into that that's recursive like oh but yeah. if he's also doing that and, and so on and so forth but um yeah cool. it's, it's some kind of self self play at the level of teams right yeah but it's it's really inter interesting direction for sure cool thanks uh, Max, yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, again, great talk. Um, uh, so I actually have a, it sounds like your hand. Okay. Um, I do need to lower my hand. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so related to the second bullet point on this limitations thing that you mm -hmm. have up here, um, it, it is definitely true, and I've seen this myself, that the data sets coverage strongly impacts your ability to use a world model in a multi-agent setting. I'm I'm curious because you, you seem to be like really interested and focused in offline, which is I think a quite important problem. Um, I'm curious how you think we should like handle this because it seems like a, a nearly fundamental limitation of the problem. Or if you had any ideas on ways we can get around this, because it seems pretty hard. Yeah, um, I'm really not an expert here, but so I think. The good thing with this like uh, world model learning is that we can leverage a lot of what has been done in the supervised um, learning community. And so either you get more data, but if that's not an option, then you have this kind of clever tricks you can do in the sense that you know that what you're trying to model is somewhat physics based. So may maybe from people trying to, to fit physical models data or people working in this area of like causality or or things like that but uh i have little and on experience in, in that area so it's, it's just ideas that that i i can throw there um but yeah it's the the good thing is that there is a whole community community working on on that aspect of the problem so this is uh reassuring in in, in some sense yeah yeah that's the, that's a totally fine answer not to be like oh we shouldn't do this because of the data is hard to get, but it's that that in itself makes it an interesting question. Yeah, Thanks. for instance, for instance, the a good aspect is that uh, in that specific case, we just did like uh, basic supervised learning, right? Like a reconstruction loss, and it gives really nice results. So if you if you 
add more sophisticated solution and expertise into that specific problem, maybe you can go a really long way. Uh, yes, Daphne? Daphne, trust in you is very low right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now I do have a question. So uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, I was wondering, maybe you've discussed this, but uh, does the, have you found anything about like what are the generalization abilities of your um, of your uh, model? Like, have you only tested it on the specific Mujoko tasks, or have you also test tried testing it on domains that were different, basically? No, it's it's only really on the Mujoko task. And we, we did not do experiments explicitly to, to, to see uh, the generalization capabilities. It, we, in the indirect way we measure that is like, oh, it's enable agents to perform better under different condition. And this requires to learn a different policy. So in that sense, it's able to generalize this dynamics to different policy queries. But uh, I think there, is, uh, there could be extensive work uh, done at, in that direction. And also, uh, maybe something to note is that to to be fair in the comparison with the model three methods, we were learning a different world model on each data set instead of like learning one big world model and using for different tasks. This would be a bit unfair because the world model had access to more uh, data in that case than the offline, um, the model three offline baselines, right? So we were learning a new world model on each data set. And this, why, this is why, for instance, for the expert data set that is, has no diversity, you learn a really brittle world model. OK. Yeah, thanks. Sure, thank you for the question. Um, I have a question, then maybe we have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, love this talk. I think this is like a very good direction. So I'm very biased here. Um, my question is, um, here the data is used for like regularizing the world model but not necessarily used for for anything beyond that like you know like imitation or you know um do you, do you have any thoughts on like what else the data should be used for like um yeah it's yeah that's a very good question and so we it's true that we only use the data in the learn simulator part. And we do this uh, in several ways. First, we learn this transition function. Then we also use it as initial state distribution. And we use it as a way of constraining the values that we generate with this like clipping uh, mechanism. But we don't use it explicitly for learning. And I think this is a, an interesting direction to reduce this training time, for instance, and maybe one approach would be something along the lines of of policy uh, reinforcement on the data set with some generated transitions to break this symmetry and, and fine tune this this policy. But then it, it becomes a bit uh, a tricky question of like how do you mix all all of this? But and also I think it's there. So I have not that much experience with online model based, but I think in there people uh, sometimes struggle with feeding to the same reinforcement learning algorithm, a real data and generated data that has some uh, difference maybe in terms of distribution and you have to, and I'm going to use a wording here, but this can confuse the reinforcement learning algorithm. And so in that case, it's maybe better to always give it a uh, real data or always give it uh, generated data instead of this mix of oh sometimes i'm getting real data that has this, this kind of features and sometimes I, i'm getting uh, generated data so this might be a, a challenge uh, to to be wary of uh, when 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 taking that approach and so and, and here again if if the question is is sample efficiency in terms of generated uh, generated uh, data, it's a bit a different problem that wa than why people justify simple efficiency in reinforcement learning, right? So maybe it's more a compute problem actually than a simple efficient problem. But um, it's, a, it's an interesting direction. 
Thank you very much. I'm going to stop the recording now. Um,